welcome to Mishmasai Television. You know, I just have to ask you this question. How close are you to Jesus? How committed are you to Jesus? You know, there are many, many, many individuals that profess to believe in Jesus Christ. And yet, as we've talked often, the Word is pretty clear that, that faith without works is dead. Uh, that one's life must exemplify their profession of faith. And, you know, I've, I've done some studying recently, and I've, I've just recently purchased a, a new uh, Bible translation called the pure word. And I have honestly been most fascinated at some of the uh, deeper understanding that I have been able to receive through this translation. I honestly have always virtually been a, a King James kind of guy, just believing that's as close uh, and accurate as we had in English. But, uh, you know, I, I want to share... I want to share a little bit about this translation real quickly, and then we'll get on to the point that, that I want to make here. But uh, the, this, particular, this particular translation, the, the pure word, uh, basically the process started with the original, inerrant, and infallible Greek scriptures as determined by the King James scholars in 1611. Now, what the pure word people did is they gathered all 5,309 surviving manuscripts and separated the 2% counterfeit texts. Approximately 98% of the manuscripts were exact copies of each other, except for the 2%. And only those were used by the scholars in the authorized translation. After the new translation was received by King James, the resulting text became known collectively as the Textus Receptus, or the Received Text. Now, we all know and believe as believers that all Scripture is inspired by God, as we know in 2 Timothy 3 and 16. And every word of God is pure. We, we know that in Psalms 126, uh, 7, and Proverbs 30 and, and 5. But since each word is pure, without mixture, it stands to reason that God is not ambiguous, or indecisive regarding the meaning of his message. As a result, each word has a single or specific meaning that is not open to personal interpretation, nor shared by another word. Translating the scriptures in this manner generates a pure monadic translation that presents an unambiguous and clear meaning of the original text. Now, I want to give you an example of, of what I'm talking about right here in a verse that many of us know by heart. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever should believe should be saved and not perish. But I want, that's the King James Virgin, Version, essentially, but I want you to hear the original transcript. Now, one of the interesting things about this is when you have the direct Greek to English translation, it does not always align itself with what we know as grammatically correct English. And so it sound, may sound a little different. However, the thing that we're after 
are the words that were spoken by God. The words that were divinely inspired by the God of glory. So, let me, let me just read the two again to you so you can get a better understanding of what I'm trying to say here. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but should have everlasting life. We, many of us have memorized that passage. But I want you to hear the original Greek to English translation of those words because I believe, and this is why I opened with the question, how close are you to God? How committed are you to the Lord Jesus? Though we say we believe, what is our level of daily commitment? And so, uh, listen Listen to the actual closest translation to the Greek. Because God has loved us in such a manner, the Satan's world, so that He gave His Son, the only begotten, risen Christ, in order that whoever, now listen closely to this, in order that whoever is continually by his choice committing for the result and purpose of Christ should not perish, but definitely should by his choice be continuously having eternal life. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Do you hear? Because what's happened over the several hundred years since the King James was, was translated, you know, even our word believe or belief has, has warped and morphed and perhaps been watered down according to what we just read here. Because what was said and spoken by God was that this is about a continual commitment to Jesus Christ. That our waking breaths are our commitment to Jesus Christ and His will to be done in our life. And, and with that in mind, I, I want to take a break over here and I want to look, uh, the other day when I was, was looking at some of these things, uh, Oswald Chambers, and again, this is, this is like the second uh, most read and printed book to the Bible, I believe, but Oswald Chambers, my utmost for his highest. Uh, incredible daily devotional. But I want you to listen to May the 20. Uh, May the 22nd, and the title of this is The Explanation for Our Difficulties. But again, remember our first question, how close are you? If you are going through a time of isolation, seemingly all alone, read John 17. It will explain exactly why you are where you are. Because Jesus has prayed that you may be one with the Father as He is. Are you helping God to answer that prayer? Or, or do you have some other goal for your life? You see, this is that other goal for your life is essentially the opposite of a continual commitment. But let's read further. Since you became a disciple, you cannot be as independent as you used to be. 
God reveals in John 17 that His purpose is not just to answer our prayers, but that through prayer we might come to discern His mind. Yet there is one prayer which God must answer, and that is the prayer of Jesus, that they may be one just as we are one, and that they is you and me, brother and sister. Are we as close to Jesus as that? Back to my first question. How close are we? Because precious ones, the hour that we are living in, the unsettling throughout the earth, the dark demonic atrocities that are pervasive in the air are unprecedented, meaning there has never been a time for you and I to be continuously, daily, moment by moment committed to Jesus Christ as today. God is not concerned about our plans. He doesn't ask, do you want to go through this loss of a loved one? this difficulty or this defeat? No, He allows these things for His own purpose. The things we're going through are either making us sweeter, better, nobler men and women, or they are making us more critical and fault-finding. And you know, what a great checkpoint for each one of us right there with the trials that you are in today, are you becoming better or are you becoming bitter? If you're becoming better, you are yielding, we are yielding ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ to bring us into that oneness that He prayed for. If we are becoming bitter and angry, we are moving further from His heart's desire and will. No, He allows these things for His own purpose. The things we're going through are either making us sweeter, bitter, and nobler men and women, or they're making us more critical and fault-finding and more insistent on our own way. Now stop and think about that checkpoint. We're becoming more insistent in our own way. That can't possibly be the right direction. The things that happen either make us evil or make us more saintly, depending entirely on our relationship or we could say our closeness to Christ with God and its level of intimacy. If we We'll pray regarding our own lives, your will be done. You know, Jesus was hanging on the cross. He was, uh, he, he was in the garden even praying sweat drops of blood, anguishing over what he was facing and, and said, Father, could it be this be taken, but not my will, your will be done. Now that, that speaks volumes about our closeness, about our continual commitment to Him. Are we yielded? Then, we will be encouraged and comforted by John 17, knowing that our Father is working according to His own wisdom, accomplishing what is best. When we understand God's purpose, we will not become small-minded and cynical. Jesus prayed nothing less for us than absolute oneness with Himself. Just as He was one with the Father. Some of us are far from 
this oneness. Yet, God will not leave us alone until we are one with Him because Jesus prayed that they all may be one. But you know, as we, as we think about this further and as we think again about this concept of being continually committed, that means, precious ones, that we start our day early in the morning Christ-centered. That is why I highly recommend, and for 25 years at the mission, we start a morning with devotionals, bright and early, because it literally calibrates us for the day. It sets the plumb line for the day. We acknowledge that God is all-powerful. He is omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent, and that we, <laughs> we're the clay in the potter's hand. And that's really what we've just read here. But are we yielded? Are we desiring? Are we committed to that oneness with Jesus Christ? I, uh, t turn with me, if you would, over to Matthew uh, chapter 7. And, and here's the, you know, Jesus gets, gets pretty clear uh, down here concerning, concerning fruit. Um, you know, it starts in verse 15, and, and you know, we, he specifically says, false prophets, but I believe that the, that the uh, uh, understanding here can be anyone that uh, is, is professing Christ in any way. But beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You will know them by their fruits. You see, you and I know that an orange seed will produce oranges and an apple seed will produce apples. Well, a disciple of Christ will produce disciples of Christ. It's, it's really quite that simple. And the actions, the behaviors, the fruit of our lives reveal who we truly are. And that is why this concept of continual commitment to oneness with Christ is imperative for each one of us and for each one of us to be engaged engendering that relationship. And there's so many ways that that can be accomplished. I mean, obviously, we, we know the Word of God. We, uh, uh, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. We know that, that when we engage in our Lord's work, we are strengthened and edified and built up we know that as we pray and we endeavor to hear the voice of the Lord, which again is dramatically enhanced when we know the Word of God, then we can, then we can hear and we can respond. But if, if we allow the busyness of this life to supersede that intentional, continual commitment, we find ourselves defeated. And you know, I'm, I'm going to have to be perfectly transparent right here. I've had two pretty major uh, physical bouts over the last four months. Uh, two UTIs, one of them I went septic. Uh, the other one, sepsis was, was forming. And I know that I know that God was slowing me down. 
I have had a tendency through life to always be, um, uh, some might refer to them as a work workaholics, but I, I have, I've always had a, a driven uh, nature. But that, at times, the busyness of that mindset has, has stolen time, I believe, that I know the Lord would desire with me. And I think, as never before, He's clamping that down, even in this hour. And again, I guess that's why this is so heavy on my, my heart personally, and why I'm compelled to share it with you, because the days, the days that we are entering, the horrific things that we will witness, if we, except we be grounded, rooted, and established in the love of God, except we be Psalm 91 kids, we're going to be undone. We're going to be completely undone, which is what you are seeing in the world today when you look at the suicide rates, you look at the massive mental health issues, you look at, at the depression, the schizophrenia, the uh, bipolar, and all of these things are, are clarity to the absence of Jesus Christ in one's life. I, we had a teacher, and I probably shared this with you before, but we had a teacher at one point in time, and she, she explained to our girls, because we've had a, many, most of our girls that have come to the mission at some point in time were diagnosed with one of those uh, mental situations, schizophrenic, bipolar, manic depressant, uh, severe depression. Well, the reality is, as Miss Joyce would explain, this is Andy Womack's sister, who was one of our teachers, but uh, she would explain bipolar. And she said, okay, it's like the earth on an axis and, and you have the pole running through it, uh, the North Pole up here, and then you have the South Pole. And she said, the North Pole is, is God and the South Pole is the devil. And she said, what happens if you're bipolar is you're out there somewhere stuck in the middle range and it's time to put all of your attention and focus to the Lord God Almighty, which was a really, really a pretty good, pretty good picture. But, but basically, you know, you shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, listen to this, even so, Every good tree brings forth good fruit. In other words, if you are born of Jesus Christ, you are a branch of the true vine, then you cannot help but be bearing good fruit. It's the Word of God. But a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. It's just, it's an impossibility. So you can't say that you know Christ, you believe in Christ, and be living like the devil. It doesn't fit. And if you think, if we think that we can, we have been grossly deceived. And so think about it. Look at your own life. I never will forget the time I heard Charles Stanley speaking and, and he alluded to a time that the Lord slowed him down, put him in a hospital bed and he's laying there with lots of questions about the state of his health and was under conviction to, to ask God to give him an inventory of his life, of inventory of things that were of concern to the Lord. <laughs> he said, Woo, he's never gotten a response from the Lord any more quickly than he did that day. And you know what? You and I can do the same thing. I have done that. I have done that. And again, I would have to agree with Brother Stanley that uh, it, it's a, <laughs> it, it can be a very quick response from the Lord to, to inform us. He wants us to know what he's working on and what is amiss, what's a foul in our lives because he wants the good fruit. Every tree that brings not forth good 
fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits, you shall know them. So precious ones today, I just want to give this opportunity to you to maybe, maybe it's a time of repentance before the Lord. And this is something you can do right where you are. But you can ask God to forgive you for having not continually committed yourself unto oneness with Him. Or if you've never known or accepted Jesus Christ and maybe have never made that intent to be continually committed to Him, today's the opportunity. So would you just pray with me if, if either of those thoughts have entered your mind? Father, uh, how thankful and grateful we are for your love. How thankful and grateful we are that, Jesus, you did make a way on the cross for our salvation. But you, you told us it was imperative that we repent. And to repent means to turn a 180 degree redirecting of our lives and our commitment unto you. So, Father, for anyone out there that is, is making that confession and commitment to repentance or anyone that is, that is asking you into their hearts for the first time, Lord, we're just asking that you will speak to each of them and direct them even into the next steps. Lord, um, let them call the number at the bottom of the screen, well, Lord, where we could get some additional help. But, Father God, we want to be ready for the days ahead, and we long for your soon coming. Maranatha, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, like I said, you can uh, call the number at the bottom of the screen. Uh, Dr. Harris would be thrilled to visit with you, pray with you, uh, get you any additional materials that you might need, get you a Bible if you need a Bible. But also, you know, you can always stop by Wow and Zip and someone will be ready to pray with you. The Lord bless you. Mm -hmm.